before Wes Craven brought us the likes of A Nightmare on Elm Street, putting the fear of God into children when it comes to bedtime, and a commentary on what horror movies had become by the mid-90s with Scream, he was making far nastier movies. So nasty that they fall under the category of video nasties, a collection of movies that tend to feature gratuitous, over-the-top violence, obscenity, and nudity. You know, the good things in life. His directorial debut with 1972's The Last House on the Left, a horrifically brutal tale of violent assault and revenge, and 1977's The Hills Have Eyes, also a horrifically brutal tale of violent assault and revenge but with baby stealing. And after covering the remakes of both The Last House on the Left and The Hills Have Eyes, it's time to take things back and to cover the originals. So that's what we're doing today, starting with The Hills Have Eyes. Thanks to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring today's video. Explore millions of champion combinations and master the countless tactics as you take on the raid bosses, dungeon runs, campaign battles, and PvP arena matches, all from the comfort of your mobile or desktop device. One of my favorite factions are the High Elves. Their backstory is pretty interesting. Their homeland, Aravia, has been around for thousands of years, surviving the fall of the Lizardmen Empire, helped the humans form into civilizations, and defeated the Orcs when they formed a huge horn and attacked the continent. But then things got twisted when Siroth, the Lord of Darkness, convinced a bunch of elves to go evil and attack the kingdom. The civil war nearly ended the elves, but Aravia survived, rebuilt, and is now stronger than ever. Avenger is my favorite high elf character due to her sleek character design and even sleeker combat abilities. This month, Raid's got a non-stop schedule of special events and activities, including Forge Pass Season 3 with some amazing rewards on offer, including a limited edition artifact set, and if that's not enough, Raid's bringing out some new champions, along with some awesome looking champion skins for the incredible Madame Ceres. Later this month, Raid is giving everybody's favorite champion the upgrade he deserves. You might have seen his struggle for awesomeness in some of Raid's hilarious videos, but finally, Death Knight is becoming a legendary champion. It's something we've all been waiting for, and I can't wait to see how Ultimate Death Knight turns out. So new players, use my link or scan the QR code right here and get a free starter pack worth almost $30, a free champion Aina, and this cool in-game loot. You'll find your rewards here in your inbox for the next 30 days only. The movie begins by introducing us to this rather inviting location known as Fred's Oasis, and by inviting location, I mean I really don't ever want to be there. It's a gas station, deep in the Nevada desert, and according to a sign, the last place to get gas for 200 miles. Meaning, the perfect amount of open space for inbreeding cannibalistic mutant men to roam around doing inbreeding cannibalistic mutant men things. We see who I assume to be Fred, seeming awfully upset towards a woman named Ruby, claiming her people have taken things too far, and it's drawn the attention of the police and the Air Force. She wants to trade with Fred, claiming that she has no food and is starving, but Fred's got other plans. He's packing up and leaving this place, but she wants to come with him. He tells her no before hiding her as a family pull up outside to fill up on gas. Bob Carter, a newly retired police detective, Ethel, his wife, their kids Bobby, Lynn and Brenda, and Doug and Katie, Lynn's husband and daughter. Bob and Ethel get to talking to Fred about visiting a silver mine somewhere out in the hills on their way through to California, and Fred heavily attempts to sway them away from going out there, stating that there's been nothing out there for years and the only thing that they'll find is animals. Well, that's a bit of a derogatory way to speak about the desert people, but okay. After Doug walks around the back and has a clear view with this guy miserably failing to stealthily move from one place to the next, I guess he just pretends that he didn't see it and gets back in the RV to leave. Well, maybe he really just was that stealthy, knowing that there aren't any silver mines waiting out there for them. More like cave people with a craving for infants, Fred attempts to warn them one more time to head straight through to California, conveniently leaving out the whole mutant desert baby eating thing. After they leave and Fred heads back inside his house, his car suddenly explodes before he notices a bloody handprint on the door. That or one of the Carters are a little too enthusiastic about finger painting. Whoever's been trading with Fred clearly isn't fond about the idea of him leaving, so how do they let him know this? Do they cut him? No, they cut themselves and make a mess of the place while they're at it for some reason. After immediately disregarding Fred's warnings about going deep into the desert, they head out deep into the desert and immediately find themselves lost. Huh, 
It's almost as if listening to the guy who's lived there for decades would have been a good idea. They discover that they're actually in a government nuclear testing site that's closed off to the public, before suddenly the loud roaring sound of jets whiz past the car and apparently give Bob quite the fright for his age, causing him to veer off the road and crash into what would seem to be a titanium bush as it snaps the car's axle. They sure don't make bushes like they used to. After getting out to assess the damage, Bobby teases Brenda and does a backflip, and Bob, really leaning into that character of a 1970s police officer, drops an N-bomb out of nowhere, and Ethel's biggest concern is him saying god damn instead of, well, you know, the other thing he said. And we see that the family are being watched from a distance by someone using binoculars, and someone who could really benefit from the use of an inhaler by the sound of things, before the mouth breather then calls Brenda a pretty girl, before excitedly rubbing his hands into the sand, like, you know, normal people behaviour. With the car being unusable, and then being exactly where they were told not to go, and realising that by the time somebody does find them, they'll be beef jerky carters, Bob and Doug decide to set off on foot in different directions. Bob is taking his gun and heading back to the gas station, and Doug is taking his quick wit and charm and heading further into the desert. Bobby, with his father's second gun, stays back with his mother, Brenda, Lynn, and baby Katie. And sometime after the pair leave, Brenda accidentally lets Beauty out of the RV, and she takes off running into the hills to see if they really do have eyes. Bobby takes off running after her, and after seeing her climbing up into the rocks, we see Beauty suddenly attack someone as Bobby can clearly hear the commotion while listening to the sound of the dog barking, followed by a sudden and sharp yelp from the dog. Freaked out by what he's just heard, Bobby pushes on calling out to Beauty when he suddenly comes across the butchered and gutted remains of his family dog, a supposed real, already dead dog carcass that was purchased by Wes Craven and producer Peter Locke from the local sheriff's department because apparently cops sell dead dogs. Somebody or something pounces out at Bobby, causing him to sprint off back down the hill, where he ends up losing his step and takes a more direct route down head first. By the time nightfall rolls around, a concerned Brenda takes Beast out looking for Bobby, where he suddenly walks right past her, failing to acknowledge the fact that their dog has been horrifically butchered and said horrific butcher tried to attack him too. Some would deem that to be important information. Bob eventually makes it back to Fred's gas station, and after entering the building, is immediately shot at. After firing back and there being no response, Bob opens a door to find Fred attempting to hang himself. A rather confusing series of events to be honest, because what was Fred's game plan here? Execute Bob and then execute himself? After getting him down, Fred explains that he thought Bob was someone else. More than likely, explaining this rather strange series of recently unfolded events, as Fred seems to be absolutely terrified of whoever's been trading with him out there, and would much rather die by his own hand compared to what they'd have in store for him. He begins to tell Bob that back in 1929, he and his wife gave birth to a beautiful healthy baby girl, and everything was great. But shortly after, she gave birth again. It's always the second one that gets you. This time it was a baby boy, but he was born 20 pounds and covered in hair, unfortunately killing his mother in the process, causing Fred to not really like him that much because apparently he really dislikes chubby hairy infants. Ten years later in 1939, Fred returned home one day to discover that the family home was burning to the ground. Unfortunately, his daughter perished in the fire, but his son was left without so much of a scratch on him, causing Fred to believe that he was responsible, leading him to pick up a tire iron, hit him across the face, and leave him out in the desert to die. And now, in present time, Fred thinks that somehow his son survived the attack, kidnapped a woman, and raised a pack of devil children somewhere out there in the wilderness. And suddenly, a man smashes through a window, grabs Fred, and drags him out into the darkness. And after Bob leaves the building to investigate, he finds Fred's corpse impaled on the inside of an outhouse door. Now that's a shitty way to die. Bob, not particularly a fan of the idea of becoming the next toilet wall ornament, begins running back towards his family. And after a while of running, he falls to the ground, terrified and exhausted, before someone emerges from the nearby bushes to take his gun. And as Bob is panting on the ground, beginning to regret just how many cigarettes people smoked back in the 70s, he hears someone over the man's radio refer to him as Papa Jupiter. Maybe this has just been some kind of big mistake and Papa Jupiter just really is a big fan of astronomy or something. Back at the RV, Bobby is still hiding the fact that Beauty has been killed as we see the family being watched from the bushes. Leading me to think, with all this bush lurking, the movie would have been better off being called The Bushes Have Eyes. 
they discover that Beast has somehow gotten free from his leash, and with Bobby already being on edge on account of the whole brutally savage dog thing, almost shoots Doug as he walks back into camp, holding a bunch of random supplies that he came across in the desert. Because if you didn't know, deserts are a great source of random supplies. More than likely the car graveyard that wouldn't be depicted until the 2006 remake, that served as a dumping ground for the cannibalistic family after they were done going all cannibalistic on the families. We see a shot of Beast guarding over the leftover remains of Beauty, before it then cuts to Ruby at her family's residence, aka a rock where she spits out the cooked remains of Beauty after hearing the dog barking, after believing that it's the spirit of Beauty as she's haunting them. Ruby is the only member of the family that clearly isn't outright evil. She's been raised amongst these people, so clearly she's done her fair share of people eating, but unlike the others, it doesn't seem like something that she's proud of. Evident as far back as the opening as when she tried to leave with Fred, not wanting to be around this anymore. Although she did kind of screw herself out of that one after snitching on him, causing him to become an unsightly bathroom ornament. An older woman then enters the room, and she's only ever identified as Mama. And she is, you guessed it, Ruby's Mama. And everyone else's Mama too, except Jupiter, because he killed his when his £20 hairy ass came out of her. It becomes apparently obvious that this cannibalistic desert family doesn't just kill people so they can survive by eating them, they clearly love the savagery that comes along with it. Because we see Jupiter forcing a cactus into Bob's mouth and nailing his hands to a tree as if he's some kind of really disturbing Christmas tree decoration. Meanwhile, Doug and Lynn are going at it in their station wagon, while we see someone outside getting a little bit of sucking action, and by that I mean they're sucking the gas out of their car as the two are a little, well, distracted. Bobby hears barking outside, so runs off towards the noise, gun in hand, and we see that it's actually somebody hiding out in the bushes, making good boy doggy noises. After a while, Bobby begins to sense that something isn't quite right out here, but when he walks back to the RV, he finds himself locked out, as we see the fuel sucker wielding a knife on the opposite side of the door. And Bobby, not being particularly the biggest fan of listening to his sister have sex, eventually decides to disturb the pair to get their set of keys. And while they're talking to him, the pair can't understand why Bobby seems to be so stressed out and uncomfortable. One, being that he's just had to listen to his sister and Doug bump uglies, and two, the dog is dead. And after telling them that and going to open the RV, suddenly a large explosion erupts in the distance, followed by the sounds of Bob's screams. Everyone sprints towards the barbecuing Bob, not realising that there's a man in the RV with Brenda and baby Katie, with Doug even entering to grab the fire extinguisher, but still not noticing on account of his father-in-law receiving a non-consensual extreme tan. And as he leaves, another man drops down from the top of the RV, and we learn that their names are Pluto and Mars. Ah uh, no, it doesn't look like it was an unfortunate mistake earlier. Jupiter seems to genuinely really like astronomy and brutally killing people. Mars begins rummaging through the family's stuff, helping himself to their food as if he was raised in a desert cave or something, before suddenly noticing the family's pet bird. And Mars, being the lover of birds that he is, he bites its head off. After pulling Pluto away, causing him to freak out and smash the RV up, Mars turns his attention to Brenda and holds her down, where it's heavily implied that he then sexually assaults her as he makes a comment towards Pluto about being a man. They get Bob down from the tree, smelling like overcooked grilled chicken, and poor old Ethel is in complete denial about that being her husband laying on the floor, looking like one of those charred bits that fell off the pan in the oven and got left there for months. Lynn begins taking her mother back to the RV, but after spotting Pluto, she sprints back to find Mars holding her baby. She knocks him to the ground where a struggle breaks out, where Mars manages to pull a gun out and shoot Ethel, before shooting Lynn in the stomach after reaching for a weapon. Still alive, she suddenly stabs him in the leg, which causes her to be made not alive as he responds by shooting her again. Pluto grabs the baby, and Mars drags Brenda out of the RV and puts a gun in her mouth in front of the rest of the family. But after all of that mother-daughter action back in the RV, he pulls the trigger, but the gun is empty. So he tells her that he'll be back to finish the job, and runs off into the darkness alongside Pluto with baby Katie. Doug heads into the RV, and after wrapping a dying Ethel in a blanket, suddenly realises that his daughter is gone, as well as his minced meat. What kind of animal eats another man's minced meat? We hear Pluto and Mars use their radio to talk to someone called Mercury and tell them that they've secured something for them to eat before Mercury makes a joke about literally eating the last baby they had's toes and something tells me that he wasn't tickling them. But Beast is actually behind Mercury, stalking him and looking to avenge the brutal death of Beauty. So Beast, liking babies to keep their toes, runs up to Mercury and sends him flying off the cliff to his death. And the good boy even picks up and takes his radio once he's done 
gun. Ah, he kills the bad guys and brings you cool stuff. Back at the RV, the battery suddenly dies, concerning the already freaked out and on edge people inside, when suddenly they hear a noise outside of the door, and after firing a few shots through it, they go outside to get startled by Beast with the radio, who fortunately didn't get hit by any of those shots. They then hear over the radio that the cannibal family have found Mercury's body, and they know that the dog did it because of a paw mark on his chest. And if you ask me, Mercury had it pretty easy. Beast could have sent him flying over the edge for a practically instantaneous death, or he could have savagely mauled him to death, causing him to bleed out gargling on his own blood. We then see Jupiter scalding Bob's… well, scalded body, saying that he's going to kill his kids' kids for what his dog's done, threatening to eat his children's brains, while chowing down on a piece of well-done Bob arm, kind of forgetting the fact that he started the whole killing each other's children thing. Morning comes around, and Doug is done waiting, so heads off into the hills, being guided by Beast, and they watch from a rock as they see Jupiter and Pluto running down towards the RV. And back at the RV, Bobby manages to get through to the Air Force rescue over the radio, and after informing their rescuers about their situation, they ask Bobby what he has to defend himself, and he responds with one gun and two bullets. But then, in an absolute gut punch of a realisation for Bobby, the voice begins to laugh. It's not the Air Force, it's Pluto, who he's just told he only has two bullets left. Doug and Beast then find the family's home, aka The Rock, and when Doug attempts to warn Bobby that the others are coming over the radio, he doesn't get a reply, so sends Beast back down. And on the way back down, Beast, with his excellent ambushing skills, attacks Pluto and begins tearing into his foot before Jupiter fires off a shot and sends him running. After Jupiter assesses the damage and sees that Pluto's foot is a mangled mess of meat, he tells Mars over the radio to kill the baby as Doug is listening in. And as Ruby hands Mars the baby, he unravels the blanket to reveal that it's a piglet. Ruby climbs off into the rocks to give the baby back to Doug, finally giving in and fully realising that what they're doing is wrong. But after realising that Mars is coming for them, Doug hands the baby back to Ruby and ambushes Mars, sending them both flying back down the hill and diverting the attention away from the baby. But Katie begins crying, and Mars begins making his way over to her. But Doug manages to catch up to him, and the pair begin struggling over a knife. And with Mars seconds away from killing Doug, Ruby comes running up behind him and uses a rattlesnake to bite him in the back of the neck, giving Doug the opportunity to take the knife and repeatedly bury it into his chest. And then he kicks him for good measure, because why not? With Jupiter gone, and his loud bang bang device gone with him, Beast returns for Pluto. But this time, instead of going for the foot, Beast goes right for the neck and begins to savage him until eventually he stops moving. Back at the RV, Bobby and Brenda, realising that two bullets more than likely won't get them very far, they channel their inner Home Alone, 20 odd years before Home Alone even existed, and use their dead mother as bait. Brenda watches as Jupiter begins running up to Ethel's corpse, and as he's standing there, they fire up the car engine, which activates a trap that wraps a rope around his ankles and begins dragging him towards them. But as he's part of the way there, the car suddenly runs out of fuel. The rest of it was used to bonfire their dad. So with Jupiter running towards them, they lure him to the RV, where they've opened the gas valves and place a match strip at the bottom of the door. They climb out of the back and watch on as they enact revenge for their family as the RV explodes, barbecuing Jupiter in the process. But not entirely, as when they return, he grabs onto Bobby, but Brenda plants an axe into his back, giving Bobby the opportunity to use the two bullets and shoot him twice. Doug then returns with Katie, Beast and Ruby, and Brenda takes Ruby's hand, symbolising her freedom from a life of savagery. And I guess no one is really questioning why Doug returned with one of the cannibalistic baby-eating family members. And the movie comes to an end. Wes Craven's early movies, The Hills of Eyes alongside The Last House on the Left, buried themselves deep into the minds of the people who watched them at the time, having a reputation for being the types of movies that look into the darker side of humanity and exposing what people can really be capable of, creating such an impact to the point where they never really went away, because both of those movies would be remade decades later. But they also really helped to serve as a launching pad for Wes Craven's career to pave the way for the likes of The Nightmare on Elm Streets which coincidentally also received a remake decades later. Huh, I'm beginning to sense a trend here. It's almost as if something does well, then 30 or 40 years later, all you need to do is just remake it with a modern day budget and technologies, and bam, money. Although, in saying that, the 2006 remake of The Hills Have Eyes is actually pretty okay in my opinion. 
Of course, it's a retreading of the 1977 story, but it takes some liberties and actually expands on the cannibalistic family a little more in a choice that I was actually glad to see be included. Which does make sense, because Wes Craven was actually involved in it, because if anybody's gonna add more to the story, well, it may as well be the guy who made it. Before we finish, I just want to let you guys know that I got a Twitter, so if you want to stay up to date with future projects and random stuff like that, be sure to click that link down below. And before we do come to an end, I just want to give a big thank you to my patrons. A big shout out to Dom, Hunters263, Rebecca Pitts, A Dandy in Space, Martin Brannan, Natasha Twyman, Jared C. Bees, Pascal Mathis, Richard McGowan III, Macy J, Reese Harford, Chris, Michelle, Dennis, Wade Knott, Ashley L. Wince, Christopher Butsky, Joshua Torres, Remy, Dyreem, Robert, Dark Shiva, Josh Hannon, Billy Whitaker, Kadaf Lopez, Lonif, Jay Slows, and Daniel Dickinson. So once again, a big thank you to all of the patrons, and thank you to everyone else for watching.